Hello and welcome to Silver Age Silver Screen. I'm your co-host, Casey Jarms. And I'm your other co-host, Riley Thorpe. And this is a podcast where we watch, discuss, and review sci-fi, cult, superhero, and other stereotypically geeky films. And Riley, do you know what day it is? Uh, no. I don't. What day it is? Because we record this two weeks in advance. It is January 5th. Riley, we made it through. 2020 is over. And I mean, sure, the major institutional problems that made that year a nightmare are still happening. But we're through 2020. Awesome. We survived. I was about to say, I can't wait for COVID to just magically be gone. Yeah. And you know, those last couple days of 2020, they were rough. I mean, we found out that the monoliths were actually alien babies. Uh COVID-20 was announced. Yeah. Kevin Spacey turned into a giant swarm of wasps and kidnapped all of Parliament. I loved when that happened. I mean, it was horrifying. But I mean, at that point, after that whole year, you just gotta laugh at it. Mm Mm-hmm. Jokes aside, as we've stated previously, we record these two weeks in advance, so it's the 21st when we're recording this. Mm -hmm. But you know, all that crazy shit that we said would happen in the last week of 2020, it could happen, you know. There's lots of crazy visions of the future out there that we've watched on this show and in our personal time. I mean, I'm still waiting for Cthulhu to show up, am I right? God, Riley... Remember, he got beaten up by Kirby. He's not going to show up again. You're right. You're right. There are a lot of visions of the future we've seen in science fiction films. And you know what? I don't think any of them are weirder than Zardoz. Oh, no. Not at all. (laughs) No way. Oh, God. As we said at the end of last episode, we went into this film completely blind. All we knew was it starred Sean Connery in a red he-man suit it was called zardoz and it's a sci-fi weird cult classic all i knew about it was like you said the name and that infamous image of sean connery wearing a very very revealing speedo and thigh-high boots and gun straps or bullet shell straps or whatever he's wearing bandoliers yeah that and with a long ponytail and a very very 1970s mustache Yeah, like just that appearance of Sean Connery, it's very different than what you normally associate with him, which is kind of the point. Apparently, uh, from what I've read, he took this role because he'd just gotten done playing James Bond and he wanted a role that was the most not James Bond role possible. And he, he found it. I'll tell you that right now. Yeah, in this weird, psychedelic, very sexual film. From 1974. Like you said, he had just gotten off of the Bond franchise, and he actually would return to the franchise for another movie like nine years later. The uh, remake of Thunderball, right? Yeah, something like that. He had just gotten off of James Bond, which is one of the most successful and famous movie franchises in history, especially at the time when it started. It was huge. And he could have gone with literally anything, and he chose to go with this... This weird sci-fi fantasy acid trip of a, of a wet dream. That's the best way I can describe this movie. It's just acid trip wet dream. How this movie starts off is we just see this floating head of a dude wearing a weird blue hat floating in a void. And he says, I am Zardoz. I am the puppet master of this story. This story that is rich with irony and very satirical. Then he explains that his real name is Arthur Freen. And if you notice, he had a goatee, but the goatee was drawn on with marker. Yes, throughout this film, the titual Zardoz has facial hair drawn on with Sharpie. It was at that point of viewing the movie that I realized, God damn, this is going to be a good watch. <laughs> You know when I realized it? When was that? With the famous, famous line, like a bit of backstory, the second scene of this, we see a giant floating stone hat flying through the sky and it lands in front of these hunter dudes with these red outfits and it starts talking. I am Zardoz. The gun is good. The penis is evil. The gun shoots death while the penis shoots life! 
And then the giant head vomits out a bunch of guns and tells all the brutal savage dudes, including Sean Connery, to go out and do some murder. Yeah. Oh, also, also, that scene ends with Sean Connery, for no real reason, turning to the camera and firing a pistol, because, you know, James Bond. It was at that point of viewing this movie that I texted you, like, I am four and a half minutes into this. I already cannot believe what I'm watching. And somehow it gets weirder. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. The title sequence is just that giant floating rock head with an angry face floating through the cloudy sky as the credits roll by. And then afterwards, it cuts inside of the head where there's just a pile of grains that Sean Connery crawls out of, holding his revolver. He walks around for a little bit, and he sees a bunch of freeze-dried people in plastic bags, and he sees Zardoz, the magician, or the fake god, as he calls himself, walking through. Oh, and by the way, this film takes place in 2000... 2293. Yes. Got the Wikipedia page, yep. It takes place 273 years away from where we're at now. Obviously, this film came out in 1974, so that was, like, almost 50 years ago. So, you know, that's how the timeline works on that. But, um, he walks around the head that has a bunch of grains and freeze-dried people. Then he sneaks up behind Zardoz and shoots him in the shoulder, to which Zardoz falls out of the head and presumably dies. But then the head lands on a calm farmland. The Sean Connery's character, we don't know his name yet, but he walks out and explores the new land. And it was at this point that for me, aesthetically, it doesn't really work for me or like it, it was a hard it was a weird adjustment for me to get used to like from an aesthetic perspective because it takes place like 270 years into the future but all the buildings are like clearly modern ish like modern from the 70s the, at one point he walks into this house with a bunch of knickknacks and human artifacts it's like a normal house he's just walking through like a modern day house in this film's defense it's not like they could make these elaborate, complex sci-fi settings. Because this film had a budget of $1.5 million. Oh yeah, I completely understand that. A big chunk of which I assume went to Sean Connery. Yes. This film is very low budget. Yeah, and that's very clear. And I'm not saying that that is inherently a negative. I'm just saying for me, it was a weird adjustment because they're passing it off as this like post-apocalyptic dystopian science fantasy but like all of the locations are clearly modern day and it just adds to the bizarre nature of this movie as a whole sean connery's character it's eventually revealed his name is zed we're gonna call him zed yeah. zed goes through this house that the giant stone had led him to the house that belongs to arthur frayne aka zardoz and just searches through this and is very clearly confused by everything he's seen in this house, it's just filled with skulls and paintings and that famous image like the evolution of man, but with a new thing on it called the Eternals. Yeah. And as he, Zed is going through this house, he finds this cool glass crystal ring and it starts projecting images, which freaks Sean Connery out because Sean Connery is savage monkey man and he like tries to hide the ring to get it to stop showing images. The audience learns over the first couple scenes of this movie that there are immortal people called Eternals that live in this sort of idyllic farmland, and then outside of it is just a post-apocalyptic hellscape where people like Zed live. Uh, we learn that Zed is a brutal someone who worships the Eternal Zardoz, the floating stone head, and goes and murders people for him for population control. Zed wanders around and he runs into other Eternals who are intrigued by him because, well, they don't normally have brutals in the farm and they decide to keep him there for study. And they start probing his memories and giving a little backstory as to who he is and then they decide that they're going to keep him around for experiments because there's something physiologically and biologically wrong with him or different about him, rather, that they're going to keep him around to study him 
And in the meantime, they keep him in a cage. And this guy named Friend starts using him for menial tasks and physical labor. Something I kind of like about this is how utterly horrifying all the Eternals are to Zeb. Oh, yeah. Like you said, they keep him in a cage next to monkeys in cage. Right. They always refer to him as it. They talk about him right next to him like he can't hear it. Yeah. They're just dicks to him. At one point they say, we can't equate its feelings with ours. Slowly throughout the film, it's revealed that there are different groups of people. There are the Eternals, which are these scientifically and intellectually peaked beings. And they have found a way to make themselves evolve to the point beyond death and sleep and sexual reproduction and that last one becomes very very clear as the film goes on but along with that they live in this heavenly idyllic closed off place called the vortex which is essentially like a heaven to everyone along with them are introduced the apathetics they're Eternals that just because of a mortality have grown so utterly bored that they don't feel anything anymore. Yeah, they're just unfeeling, unthinking beings that just stand there. There's also the Renegades, which are evil old people because because Eternals are immortal. The way that they punish each other when they do crimes is to force each other to age but not die. So there's just a building on the Eternal farm full of these evil, violent old people. <laughs> and that was a really funny scene, because later on, one of the tasks that Friend makes Zed do for him is when they're delivering bread, he's explaining their criminal justice system to him, because at one point, there is a guy who just starts harassing this woman in such a weird way. Like, he's getting all up on her, like, making all these weird yeah. noises and dances. I... I think it's supposed to be that they're like, because they, all the Eternals, they have mind powers, that he's like harassing her mind. But the way it's shot, it's just like, have you ever seen two ducks fight, like with their wings out and like scowling out each other? That is what it was like. <laughs> When Zed starts asking about what's going to happen to that guy, Friend starts explaining to him what we just mentioned, how he's going to be aged but not die, and how it all works there. And honestly, you know, at this point, this movie really reminds me, or at least this section of the movie reminds me of that episode of Rick and Morty called Raising Gazorpazorp. That it's the one where Rick buys Morty a sex doll and that gives him like right, a right. I remember yeah, it. And it's like there's the intellectual women, and then everyone on the outside is just brutal savages and shit like that. I don't know why, but that's just what this point of the movie reminds me of. Speaking of intellectual women, in addition to Friend, there are two other Eternals that really get a decent amount of screen time. One of them is Consuela, a woman who is very suspicious of Zed and is throughout the film just saying, hey, we should just execute him because he's bringing chaos to our idyllic community. Just get rid of him before he destroys everything. Spoiler alert, he does destroy everything. The other is May, a sort of scientist who does a lot of tests and interrogations to figure out what exactly Zed's deal is. Including one scene that is... There are a lot of really uncomfortably sexual scenes in this movie. There's a scene where May has Sean Connery watch porn. There's a scene of Sean Connery watching porn with a woman staring at his junk to see if he gets hard from watching porn. This is a very 1970s film. When that scene started, I swear to God, I out loud said, no way, they're not having a sex ed class in the middle of this scene. Basically, what they're talking about is they're explaining the idea that scientists, even 300 years into the future, have not figured out what exactly is the link between human genitalia and arousal. They show him porn clips, uh, they show him soapy titties and mud wrestling, and he does not get an erection. However, when he and Consuela stare at each other, he does get an erection. This is in this movie, people. Casey and I watched this. 
This isn't a movie with James Bond. Yeah. It's so bizarre and creepy how sexual this movie can be at times, and it does so a lot. In fact, stepping away from the plot for a second, like... A lot of the film's themes seem to be related to sex and violence. The Eternals, who are this peaceful, non-violent society, they, well, they don't have sex anymore because what's the point? They live forever, which I don't actually think is what would happen. Right. But whatever. I mean, condoms exist. Yeah, exactly. Uh, contrast that with Zed, who is this brutal outsider that comes in. And it's shown throughout the film. Violence makes Zed's dick hard. <laughs> he isn't turned on by porn. He's turned on by Consuela yelling at him. There's a scene where he tries to rape an apathetic. By the way, Sean Connery's really rapey in this film. It's, oh, yeah. Oh, boy, it's uncomfortable. We watch a scene, like one of the flashbacks, like when they're probing his memories, like one of the flashbacks is of Sean Connery's character raping a woman. Yeah, and it's horrible. And there's another scene where when he meets the apathetics, he just tries to rape one, but stops when she doesn't fight back. This is a film thematically about the connection between sex and violence and how, at least what I assume by how the film goes on, saying that violence and sex being connected is a good thing. And ugh, it's... I don't like that. It's so uncomfortable. Why do they have scenes of Sean Connery watching porn and raping women? I don't know. Ugh. The filmmaker of this movie, the movie he did right before this was called Deliverance, which is like a hillbilly exploitation, like thriller horror movie. So this, and especially at this time, it seems like that filmmaker, he's very much so operating in the world of 1970s schlock and exploitation, which was obviously popular at the time. A lot of like genre films from the era were very exploitative and very schlocky and cheesy. And I think that this fits perfectly in with that time period. I don't consider this so much of a science fiction movie. I consider it more so science fantasy. A uh, science fiction film with a lot of fantasy elements. A prime example of a classic science fantasy is Star Wars. Hey, remember the scene in Star Wars where Luke watches porn and rapes a woman? Uh, I do not, but I... <laughs> <laughs> Actually, wait, wait, hold on. Never. I was making a joke that, well, yes, but Star Wars is good science fantasy because it isn't super rapey. But there is, in the holiday special, a scene where Chewbacca's dad watches porn. Yeah. Check out last week's episode. Oh, yeah, it's a lot of fun. But the thing about Star Wars, at least from what I gather, is it's like Star Wars has a very clearly defined world. It's a world of science with fantasy in it. You know, there's spaceships, there's laser guns, there's droids, but then there's also Jedi and lightsabers and the Force, and it, it's all very well defined. In this film, there's really no clear definition of what the fuck this world actually is. Like, everything that's fantasy is explained away by science, but then a lot of other shit happens, and it's like, well, how does that science... Is that science just fantasy? Like, it's explained the fact that the reason why the immortals are immortal is because they have evolved to the point beyond death, which is very clearly science fiction. But then towards the, and this is cutting a little ahead, but it's later explained that it's because of magic crystals. And it's like, well, when the hell did these things come in? Yeah, this film, it... It's something you see in a lot of really old science fiction that feels kind of weird to modern audiences. Psychic powers were just common in science fiction back then. Like, people thought, oh yeah, we're gonna get scientific, and then we're all gonna have telepathy, because yeah. telepathy is real. And, I don't know, it's weird. I know, it's just one of my biggest issues with this is that the world is never defined, you know? It's just this weird hodgepodge of science fiction and fantasy that just doesn't really make a lot of sense, which does add to the trippiness of this film as a whole. And yes, that sex ed scene where he's turned on by violence is very uncomfortable. Yeah, like, I've heard people talk about how Sean Connery's James Bond isn't super into consent. I've never actually seen a James Bond film, by the way. But I've heard people criticize James Bond's consent. <laughs> well, James Bond is a saint compared to Zed. 
It's pretty bizarre, because if you really think about it, I mean, you don't even have to think that hard. If you, if you watch the fucking movie, you realize that the protagonist is a guy who murders and rapes. Like, his life is murdering and raping people, and it's just sort of breezed over. And admittedly, that's because, like, Zardoz, like, manipulating him and ordering him to do it. But still, yeah. Yeah. Evil stuff done by religion is still evil. It doesn't change the fact that it's very, very uncomfortable. I, I'll save it for the end, but there are a lot of really, really good ideas in this film, hampered both by the budget and the fact that the director was high as shit when he made this, yeah. which he said in commentary, I looked it up, and also just the uncomfortable constant sex-violence connection. It's not... I don't have a problem with sex. I don't have a problem with violence. I have the problem with violence and sex being intertwined intrinsically, as this film states. Yeah, this movie has some weird messages, to say yeah. the least. But anyway, as the film goes on, Friend basically teaches Zed that the vortex, while the Eternals live, it sucks. Half of them are waiting for death, but they happen. can't talk out about it because everyone who speaks out is aged up and sent to live with the renegades in the evil old folks' home. Right. And Friend eventually snaps and just yells at all the other Eternals and they punish him. It's actually a cool scene. Zed runs to the renegade house to, like, find Friend. And he sees Friend and, oh, it's the same actor. He looks normal. And then he turns his head and, oh, no, he's like Two-Face now. Half of his face is just super freaking old. And around that same time, May is continuing to experiment on Zed. And she finds out that he is a breeder and he's a mutant. Maybe it's just the fact that I wasn't paying attention close enough. I think I was, but maybe I just misunderstood something. But I don't know exactly what that means. I think from the plot, the term mutant means Sean Connery is smarter and stronger, and he got that good jizz yeah. that all the ladies want. Oh, yeah. But yeah, so she's basically saying that she has a moral and legal obligation to kill him, but she's going to keep it a secret and continue experimenting on him. Then there's a scene where Friend gets exercised by the rest of the Eternals, and he's sent to the Renegade house where he tells the rest of the renegades that Zed is mortal and will die, so the rest of the renegades attack him. It was at this moment, upon watching this scene, that I realized this is not an action movie, you know? No. Like, there are no action scenes in this. The first half of this movie is a half-naked Sean Connery standing around as weird shit happens around him and he gets boners. That's all that happens in the first half of this movie. Oh, what do you mean first half? That continues on into the second right, half. Right, but at least in the second half, something happens. He runs away from some shit. Like, he doesn't fight anybody necessarily. He just gets attacked by people and then runs away, you know? Speaking of that, about midpoint of this film. By the way, this film, it's only like two hours, but this film drags oh, yeah. on. Especially in the second half. But about halfway through the film, during his meetings with May, it's finally revealed what Zed's whole deal is. That while he was out doing his murder stuff, found a library and learned to read. And then this mysterious old man who was there gave him a book that caused him to have a mental breakdown and decide to kill God. And you know what book he found? The Wizard of Oz. Dun, dun, dun! The Wizard of Oz. Yeah. Zardoz. The wizard had a giant floating head to trick people into thinking he was a god. Zed realized his god was fake, and it broke him, and he decided to get revenge. So he snuck aboard the giant floating head, and he killed Zardoz and went to the vortex, and then he got a bunch of boners. <laughs> yeah, that pretty much sums up everything. With the help of a mysterious stranger, Zed learned how to read, and he found the Wizard of Oz. If you cover up the W-I in wizard, and you cover up the word of, together what's left is the word Zardoz. And, can be honest, that actually, I thought that was clever. I didn't pick up on that till they spelled it out, yeah. but... 
Obviously, as soon as this film starts, you get Wizard of Oz vibes with the floating godhead that is made by a magician. And it's a nice foreshadowing with the title. And another thing that I really actually liked about this scene is I love it when post-apocalyptic films, they explore the idea of books and literacy as like a form of power, you know? There was a movie made a couple of years ago called The Book of Eli which is with Denzel Washington, Gary Oldman, and Mila Kunis, about the world that has just destroyed by nuclear war. And Gary Oldman plays a guy who's like the dictator of this town who's trying to find a book that will basically give him unlimited power. And coincidentally, Denzel Washington's character, his name is Eli, he comes to town and he has that book that Gary Oldman is looking for. And in the end, it's revealed that the book that Eli has and that Gary Oldman characters want is the Bible. I enjoyed the movie. I saw it when I was a lot younger. But it's fascinating to me the idea that knowledge is power and the idea that even in a post-apocalyptic future, books and literacy and knowledge will still determine humanity's survival. You know? And that's the common theme with this film. There is a lot of really good ideas in this film. It's just they're drowned under a bunch of boring scenes and uncomfortable scenes and psychedelic scenes that go on way too long. You know? Oh, yeah, absolutely. There are good bones in this. They just aren't properly fleshed out. So... The way May learns that Zed decided to kill God because he read The Wizard of Oz, in that scene, she does it by getting real close to him under some covers, possibly having sex with him. And then Consuela walks in and is disgusted by this and decides that the Eternals will punish May and kill Zed. And Zed just runs away. And then he spends like half the film just running. And the reason why May helped him at all is because after he met with the renegades, he decided that he needs to destroy the tabernacle, which is the reason for the immortals' immortality. They don't at first, like, make it clear, but the tabernacle is, like, the AI that is controlling them that they're talking to through these rings. Zed convinces May to help him destroy the tabernacle, and she demanded that he be honest with her about how he got there and what happened to him, and that's how we got that scene. But yeah, you're right. After that, he spends the entire rest of the movie running around. And it's very dull. There are some weird stuff in that where he kisses the apathetics and it cures them of their apathy and just makes him really horny. The renegades dress him up in a wedding dress so he can go find friend. He runs through friend's statue collection for a while. But ultimately, he goes to May's cool mind pyramid, which is bigger on the inside, where they store all the information. And he learns everything. He absorbs all of humanity's knowledge and becomes hella smart. Via osmosis, he becomes omniscient. Sure, (laughs) sure. And also in there, he's given this diamond and is told, hey, this diamond's important. Yeah. Also, what's crazy is that after he's discovered by Consuela, they have a fight and she blinds him. But then May, like, treats his eyes back and gives him health. And then she gives him a leaf that says, like, you'll know what this is and when to take it when the time comes. And at that point, an angry mob of the Eternals tries to break into the plastic wrap enclosure that they're keeping him in. And they break through it. And at one point, they tackle him to the ground with the tarp on top of him. And he breaks through the barrier and someone says, that's impossible. It's indestructible. And it's and I'm sitting there like, yeah, yeah, the, the barrier that you all just broke through, he can't break through because it's indestructible. What? And then he runs around for a little bit and then he's hiding in the barn This is the scene when he kisses all the apathetics. And makes them super horny. Right, exactly. He's waiting in the barn and kissing all the apathetics. The house right next to the barn, all the Eternals light it on fire to smoke him out. Because he must be in this building. Like, why are you burning your houses, people? Why don't you just go inside and, you know, capture him? It's not like he's going to fight back. 
because he doesn't fight back. He just fucking runs. Yeah, he could fight back. He got gun. True, but he barely uses it. Wait, wait, hold on. No, that is dumb. He can't fight back. They're immortal. Yeah, exactly. This movie is... God, it's... They tried. That's the thing. Points on you guys. Points on them for taking risks and trying something new. Absolutely. But, god damn, there were moments my head was hurting of how stupid some of these scenes were. So eventually, Zed realizes that this diamond that he was given is actually the big computer that is controlling everything. And now he must destroy it. He just fucking shoots it and it breaks. Yeah. And that, remember that leaf I told you about that when he was having his eyes healed? <laughs> After he's kissing the apathetics... He takes the leaf and runs away. And nothing comes of it. Like, what the hell was the point of that? Like, literally, nothing happens. Yeah, and when he destroys the yeah. computer, he gets trapped in a hall of mirrors for way too long, and it's so repetitive. Yeah, he just runs through this labyrinth of mirrors and shoots at everything until he finally sh until he shoots a reflection of himself, and then he starts bleeding. And dying. Yeah, which is kind of trippy. I do like the idea. It's kind of cool. Like when he destroys the computer and is teleported to the weird mental hall of mirrors, the computer says that everyone else is dead now except you and you'll be here for eternity, which is kind of creepy. Yeah. I mean, there was a second. I thought that was like actually how this movie was going to end. Like he was going to be trapped in that forever. It was only for a little bit. No, no, but this movie's ending after breaking out he walks out and all the eternals they're now mortal right and they just start fucking killing each other it the film ends with everyone just gunning each other down well it was at that point that the exterminators who are like the band of right right that zed's, zed's from, crew they break in and just start killing everyone and shooting them while all of the Eternals are like, I want to die, please kill me, and then they get shot and killed. Zardoz shows up again, and the last we see Zardoz is him and friends saying, hey, let's go kill ourselves. Yay! Ooh, also, there's a really nice line. Zardoz, after he reappears in the plot, he tells Zed that he's the puppet master who's been manipulating him all the time and used eugenics to create him. And then Zed says, cool. But now that I know everything, I know who's pulling your strings. Yeah, and there was another really interesting line, because Zardoz does appear to Zed to be alive, like you said. Uh, there is another very interesting line that struck me. It was when he said, Zed, the slave that freed his masters, or something to that effect. Uh, there is good stuff in this movie, just... Yeah. Exactly. So yeah, all the renegades start to grow old and die. The Eternals get shot and killed by the Brutals, and Zed escapes with Consuela into a nearby... I don't even know where. They just run into the forest and make their way to a cave. Yeah, according to... I didn't get it when I watched it, but according to the plot summary that I keep glancing at to make sure I get things right, they end the film just living in the stone head. Okay. But they just throw a stone wall of it. Like, show the eyes or the mouth, right, you know? Right, exactly. Like, you had the set. Why didn't you use it? I don't know. But yeah, the last scene of this film is a montage of Zed and Consuela making it to the stone head where they bang and she gets pregnant, gives birth to a baby. That baby grows up and becomes an adult, leaves the house. Zed and Consuela grow old together and die. And then we see their skeletons and we see a painted handprint on the wall. And then that's the end of the movie. Yeah. Also, not to nitpick, but the ending of this film, their skeletons are still holding hands. And I guess it could be a nice romantic thing if they had any chemistry at all in this yeah. film. But how does that work? Skeletons don't hold hands. They don't got muscles. Also, I guess that implies they died at the same time, because it would be real messed up if one of them was just holding a corpse to make sure that they had the cool shot of the skeletons holding hands. It's what keeping me up in the night times, my guy. <laughs> so... What can we say about this film that we haven't already said? I love the philosophy with the who wants to live forever, right. immortality is a curse, this perfect society 
being destroyed by just this mortal outsider. That's really good. But also, so much... Oh, God. We keep saying uncomfortable, and it isn't just that the whole sex and violence thing makes the film not fun to watch. It's that I don't really agree with it as a philosophy and think that it's a good theme, you know? I mean, it does sort of explore, like, the base, primal, primitive human nature that we have. But in terms of exploring it, like, from us as a civilized people and a civilized society and culture, it's just messed up, to say the least, you know? Like, sex and violence is what humanity, like, it's a part of human evolution, but it's just explored in the way it does and the way it tries to justify it is in this day and age, is just gross and exploitative, as if that makes sense. By the way, there is so much full frontal female nudity in this film. There is tons. And I guess it's balanced out by the fact that we, throughout the entire film, we can see Sean Connery's dick. His diaper is tight. Very tight. But yeah, like at any random point, they'll just cut to a woman and she'll be topless. Like, oh, okay. I mean, don't get me wrong, not exactly complaining. But still, it's like, what? why does this need to have... What purpose does this serve in the movie, exactly? You know? It's very weird that Connery would choose to do a movie like this. I mean, I get he had some trouble finding work after James Bond wrapped up. And I get that. And I get he wanted to do a project that was as little like James Bond as possible. But doing, like, a weird, trippy science fantasy film like this, where... They have scenes where he's just, he's being kept in a cage and they're showing him pornographic images. It's, it, it, it's just, it's just weird. You know, it's just bizarre. And it's weird to me because it's like, why, why of all things, this is coming off of James Bond. You could literally do anything you wanted and you're choosing to do this. It reminded me a lot like that horrible horrible Robert Downey Jr. Dr. Doolittle movie that came out in January of last year, you know? Oh, yeah, was that really bad? It didn't look good, but was it that bad? The climax of Doolittle is Robert Downey Jr. giving a dragon an enema with his own hands. Okie doke. He's reaching his hand up a dragon's ass, pulling out a bunch of shit so that it can fart and it would feel... Let's hold on, hold on. You say shit. Do you mean stuff or feces? Like stuff, like okay. armor and treasure and shit like that. And then the dragon farts all over his face. And th- that's the climax of the movie. Well, I know I'm not going to watch that one. Yep. Nope. Don't bother. Also, I couldn't, I can't, I couldn't figure out a organic place to put this in. But let tits now, <laughs> just gotta say it because there's so much titty in this movie. Yeah, love that. My family and I were actually just watching those clips uh, a few days ago. That's a good sketch. R.I.P. Sean Connery and also Alex Trebek. Yeah, rest in peace. Well, they weren't in that sketch. It was parodies right, of them, exactly. but you know what? Yeah, I mean. still. But uh, yeah, I don't, I don't. Anyway, there's just all I'm saying is Connery doing this after James Bond reminds me a lot of how Robert Downey Jr. After 11 years of playing Iron Man, he does do little like. Of all the things you could have done, you go with this? What 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 the hell? Why why is this a thing, you know? In terms of the overall plot of the movie, I was so bored. There were a lot of really good ideas being thrown around, but overall, this movie is so boring. It is. At least in the climax of the movie, like at least some shit is happening. Yeah, it's trippy, weird, doesn't make a lot of sense, but at least something is happening. And what, and what is happening isn't like this creepy, predatory, sexual shit that I'm like wincing at. But yeah, you're right. There's a lot of very interesting themes, at least in conception, being brought up. Mortality versus immortality. The advancements of science and its effect on humanity. Sex and violence and stuff like that. And in conception, there's a lot of interesting ideas being brought up. But there's also a lot of really bizarre and, quite frankly, uncomfortable conclusions being drawn with them. In terms of the movie itself, at least 45 minutes could have been cut out of this movie. Mm -hmm. Because editing isn't just what you see, it's the stuff that is taken out. 
half this movie could have not been in the movie. That's all I'm saying. And at that point, we wouldn't even have a movie, so whatever. The acting, the writing, the production design, the special effects, they're so cheap, cheesy, it's hilarious. Everything else is just a product of 1970s schlocky exploitation cinema, like the directing, the cinematography, all that. This is very much so a product of the 70s. You know, I will say the best thing I can say about this movie, this is different than any other movie I've ever seen. Oh yeah. It's very creative and unique, and some of it works. We joked about it being weird, but I really liked the floating head of Zardoz open I like Sean Connery just going into the mind pyramid. I honestly kind of like the costume, even though it's ridiculous, because, it, I mean, it's in a ridiculous film. But for every idea that was creative that works, there were three more that just fell flat. And a lot of that creativity can be uh, attributed to the writer, director, producer, John Borman, who essentially had complete creative control over every single aspect of this film. And like we said, there's a lot of good stuff, but there's also a lot of bad stuff that just outweighs it by a lot. It does take a lot of risks, and it is definitely very creative. I'll give John Borman that. I couldn't remember his name earlier, but I looked it up. There's some good stuff here, but it's just wrapped up in a package that doesn't totally work most of the time you know well on a scale of one for ten how little does this film work here's what i'll say i understand why this is a cult classic i understand why a lot of people would like it it's just for me i don't ever see myself re-watching it overall it's not like horrible it's certainly not the worst movie we've seen this year well actually it is the worst movie we've seen this you're year you're right when this it comes out it's the first episode of 2020 right. i misspoke one yeah you're right i misspoke but uh it's not the worst movie we've reviewed this sh- on this show but from a scale of one to ten i'm probably gonna give it a four and a half i'm never gonna watch it again there was some interesting stuff a lot of bad stuff that made me uncomfortable i understand why people like it but it's just not for me so i'm gonna give it a four and a half out of ten yeah and i appreciate the creativity and i appreciate a lot of the themes in the hands of a more competent writer there are some good ideas in this film that could be made great it's just It's not an entertaining film to watch. I did not enjoy this film at the end of the day. So 6.5, I guess. Honestly, I'm glad I watched it. Looking back over the last, like, God, what has it been? It's been like, what, five months of us doing this now? It's been a while. Yeah, let's see. Looking at this, this is episode 20 weeks. We've been doing this for 20 weeks. Yeah, so this is like, what, episode 20 now? Yeah. I'm glad that I have the opportunity to watch a lot of these movies that I was interested in but I was unaware if I was actually going to get around to eventually but I'm glad that I had the chance to see this and make my judgment on it but overall this one was just I didn't really dig this one that much to be perfectly honest with you yeah you know back in January of last year or this year we were recording this in twenty. I decided to uh, keep a log of every film I saw in 2020 and if you look at it all the early stuff on it is really good I watched some solid films yeah. and then I started doing this show <laughs> then we talked about the Star Wars holiday special and Captain America 1990 but I'm glad that I have the chance to view movies like this because i'd seen the photo of sean connery wearing this costume already and i had guessed i'm like okay i'm interested in figuring out what the hell this is you know sean connery obviously he's no stranger to doing weird movies over good movies like he turned down playing morbius in the matrix and gandalf in lord of the rings for movies like the league of extraordinary gentlemen and the avengers not the Marvel's Avengers, the reboot of the 
weird British sitcom, The Avengers, that he did that was horrible. But regardless, I'm glad that I'm doing this show to broaden my horizons about cinema and genre films as a whole. And I'm also very happy that we went into this completely blind. We had no idea what to expect with this. And Yeah, that was a good call. Yeah, I think for cult classics, that's what we should do. Or we should try to do, you know? Go into a cult classic knowing as little about it as possible. I'm down for that. Although, admittedly, as I was buying this off Amazon Prime, and not to support Amazon, but they're a monopoly, which makes it hard to not support them. As it was, like, processing my payment, the trailer played, and oh no, I've been spoiled. Although, the trailer didn't really show much of plot, it just gave us the words, in a world of eternal life, he brings death. Which is a really cool trailer line. Yeah, absolutely. But there's a difference between a movie having a good trailer and the movie actually being good. Yeah. Riley, where can they find you? You can all find me on YouTube at Riley Thorpe, where you can check out all my latest short films and video essays. You can also find me on Instagram and TikTok at Riley James Thorpe, all one word. And you can find me on Facebook at Riley Thorpe and Twitter at Riley Thorpe 7. You can find me on Twitter at Jarms Casey, J-A-R-M-E-S-C-A-S-E-Y. I post links to some of my short stories there. Maybe read some of them them. If you like them, consider buying one of my short story collections. We'll be back next week, assuming we don't get killed by cultists dressed in diapers and bandoliers who chant, the god is good, the penis is evil, and then murder us. Next episode, we're going to be watching Justice League The New Frontier. It's an animated direct-to-DVD Justice League movie that I've heard is good. I watched it, like, once when I was, like, 11 and remembered enjoying it. It's a film with an interesting idea behind it that we'll get into in, when we actually review it. Yeah, and this is going to be our first animated movie review. Yeah, you're right. As always, I'm Casey Jarms. And I'm Riley Thorpe. And, hey, it's just a movie. Don't lose your head over it. Especially not to a ladder. <laughs>